spring has sprung and who would have believed we'd be in lockdown for a whole year or indeed that we'd still need to have the central heating on today anyway we have some lovely aspects of spring to share with you this evening brought to you by the blooming gorgeous Suzanne before we let her loose may I thank all of you from Inverness to Spain, from Plymouth to Canada, where I'd like to say happy birthday for yesterday to Jerome, and all the way along and up Whitmore Gardens. A quick reminder before we start the talk, we have 30 minutes to hear from Suzanne and there'll be a little time for questions at the end. Please mute your microphones. We do try and do this for you except that sometimes we fail and we mute ourselves. And please don't fidget if your camera is on because it will distract us. Suzanne has selected some lovely spring pictures today and with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to her. Suzanne, hello and welcome. Hello and good evening, everybody. And we are going to start tonight with John William Inchbold from Yorkshire. If you could have our first picture, please. There we are. Um, his style was influenced by the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and who, um, who absolutely kept to acute observations of nature. Now, when I started to look for uh, pictures for, of spring, I actually found it very difficult until I thought very carefully about what it was, what spring meant for me. And I then understood that when we come out of winter, the long, cold, dark winter, we start to crave for spring. It is a visceral, it's a physical desire for warmth and light. And when I kept these things in my mind, then it, I could start to find the sort of pictures I wanted. So this is Inchbo's picture, and it's obviously, it's very early spring. And the qualities of spring are that the light starts to get a bit stronger, but it's still cold. And, uh, and you can see this in this painting because the sky has this sharp blue and it, that color, because the air is very clear because the wind is blowing and the sun is stronger. So we has this beautiful blue, but for me, it's still quite cold. The painting has this uh, road that goes from left to right. So we go from left to right again. And almost in the middle of the painting, you see this ewe with her two lambs. And that is absolutely a symbolic of spring more than you could, it's just perfect. And then, but the subtle different indications of spring are for me, if you look at the bark on the tree, you'll see that the lichen in it are starting to become lighter in color. They're more yellow and more green. And I think that is a portent of spring. And to the right hand side, at the very bottom, you will see some little primroses and some spring flowers. And that also is a portent of spring. So I just think this is a wonderfully observed painting of nature and of landscape. At the, um, at the very beginning of spring. Suzanne, did yeah. you say how old this painting is? Because if I were to look at this without knowing, I'd say it was quite modern. Am I right? Well, I, what's modern in the history of, of the world? But it's painted, he lived from 1830 to 1888. So I would thought this is about the 1860s, 1870. So it's Victorian. Okay, it's Victorian. I, I, I would, I'd have imagined it was later. And I'm glad you've got frolicking lambs because we cannot have spring pictures without frolicking lambs. Yes, there's some beautiful little lambs. Could you there. please repeat who it's by? It's by John William Inchbold. Thank you. From Yorkshire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makes all the difference. A beautiful Yorkshire landscape. Probably. And the next painting, please. That's now, it. this is lovely. And you're going to tell us where it is in case we can't guess. Well, it's by, um, it's called Small Meadows. And in spring, 1880, by Alfred Sisley. And he, uh, in the 1880s, he settled and lived near moret sur loin which is uh, in the Ile de France near Fontainebleau. And this is painted along the Seine. He painted the Seine all the time. And he, 
he always painted this wonderful, he painted wonderful water and wonderful skies. And if you look, the sky is over half this painting. And you can see again, this sharp, cold blue. And you can see, for me, the wind is blowing and it's cold and the clouds are moving from left to right. And again, in this painting, the trees are bare and absolutely there's no, there's just some dead leaves on those trees. But at the bottom of those trees, uh, just to the right of the little girl, you'll see some, uh, it's possibly blackthorn in flower. Here we have the road coming from the right, going into the center of the painting and then off to the right so that you are taken into the painting and then back because we have to go from the left to the right. Um, around the, the girl's feet are probably wild daffodils and she seems to be picking some and looking at them in her hand. Um, typical of Sisley, he was an impressionist and to keep in with the impressionist, uh, he always seemed to always be painting outdoors. He was utterly inspired by the great outdoors. And when you've seen one or two Sisley paintings, you start to be able to recognize them because of the beautiful skies and the beautiful colors he has on them. And to me, this is, this is a spring painting because it's still quite cool. You can still feel that it's not quite that warm. And it's interesting, Suzanne, because you said it feels cool. Without the spring flowers at the bottom, would you know it was spring? Um, I don't know. What do you think? There's something slightly warm in the sunshine to me, and the girl's got a yellow hat, which is spring-like. But when you said, look at how much sky there is and how windswept the sky is, I was trying to think, what tells me it's spring apart from the flowers? Actually, you're right about the sun. The, the light is sharper, and you see, you see the shadows. I would say it's about three o'clock in the afternoon-ish. Two to three o'clock in the afternoon. Our next one, okay. This one, unsurprisingly, is called Laburnum, and it is by Stanley Spencer and was painted in 1936. Um, he, it says when I looked him up, it said that he produced landscapes for commercial necessity, uh, but he, it was based on close, again, on close observation of nature. Spencer, Stanley Spencer is one of the great English painters. And if you don't know him, do look him up. His paintings of the First and Second World War are marvelous. And especially his great painting called Resurrection, which is in the Tate Museum. And he um, studied at the Slade School and he was friends with Dora Carrington and Mark Gertler and all, all of those guys. It's a very famous group of painters. Now, what I was utterly attracted me about this painting was this cascade of laburnum blossoms, this whooshing down, this extraordinary generosity of these flowers. They called golden lanterns, and they take up about two thirds of this painting. And just below it are wisteria in flower, these little dots of blue. And then off to the right, there's a lovely cedar tree. Um, and of course, to have laburnums in this state, it's probably end of April, beginning of May. So these three paintings are almost the three periods, the very beginning, and then almost to the, to the middle of spring. And now we have the full blown spring flowers and the warmth has at last returned. And lots of yellow. Lots Is that the color of spring, do you think? There's something about yellow. Yes, I think there's just a generous beauty Titiousness about that quantity of laburnum flowers. I don't think we see laburnum very often. I know we don't have them in Whitmore Gardens, but I don't recall seeing many. I see Forsythia, but not laburnums. Um, there's none along Whitmore Gardens, as far as I know. <laughs> okay, shall I go to the next painting? Yes, please. Now, this painting, I absolutely had to have, there was no, um, I had to have this painting because it is absolutely spectacular. And we're going to spend quite some time on it because it merits it for very many reasons. Um, it's called Primavera. It's by Sandro Botticelli. It's in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. It was painted the late 1470s to the early 1480s. It's, it's six foot by 10 and a half feet. So it's very big. 
it's tempera on board, uh, it's it painted on, on wooden boards, and it was painted for Lorenzo di Pianfrancesco de Medici, who was a cousin of Lorenzo de Medici, the fabulously wealthy merchant prince and ruler of Florence. It was probably painted to celebrate the marriage of di Pianfrancesco, uh, and paintings and furniture were quite often given as presents and they got married in July 1482. We must remember that Botticelli was considered as an employee. So we remember the painting because it was painted by Botticelli, but in fact, at that time, he was merely an employee who was required to comply with the commission and paint according to the remit. So what he painted was very strictly um, laid down for him. Now, the Medici court at that time had attracted many writers and or, um, architects and scholars and included the Neoplatonist Piccino, who was at that time translating uh, Plato's works for Lorenzo de Medici. So he would have been consulted very closely as what had to be portrayed. So what has been portrayed is spring and the praise of beauty, especially feminine beauty, and the thing is that he was con considered to be close to godliness, so that even though these are what we would call pagan figures, but because they're represented uh, uh, in beauty, that was also taking us closer to God. And as I said, this is really celebrating feminine beauty and uh, fecundity, because in, a, in marriage, you needed the, the bride to be able to produce children. So the nature and fecundity and, uh, and all of that is being celebrated here. Um, there are also, because it was commissioned for the Medici family, there are constant little references to the Medici family. And one of those references is in all those golden fruit because golden orbs like that were part of the Medici uh, uh, arms. So that was when people, the uh, contemporaries looked at that, they would have known that it was, part, it was a reference to the Medici family. So if we could have the next one, please. Sorry, Suzanne, could, can, could you just tell me who the figure in black was in the last one? The figure in black. We'll be going through it. We'll be going through all the characters one by one. So you'll oh. know who everybody oh. is. Okay. Oh. Okay, thank you. So this is a Flemish tapestry, and I'm showing you this so that you can start to see where, where the whole style of the Primavera comes from. And it's called a Mila Fiore, which means a thousand flowers. And you can see they're in sort of a, a wood surrounded by flowers. Now, the medieval tapestries would have been about, could be anything from five, six, eight feet long and about four or five feet high. And tapestries like this were worth six, seven times more than a painting. And the palaces in Florence and all over Europe for the very super rich would have had tapestries, which again would denote how wealthy and how cultured you were if you could afford to have them. So this sort of, this image would have influenced what then Botticelli painted. Suzanne, was this from the same period as the Botticelli? Yes, it was. Thank you. Do you want me to go to the next Oh, yes, picture? please. Yes, please. So now we're going to delve inside well, the Botticelli. So we're going to go back to it again and talk a little bit more in general about it. So as you can see, it is, it's, it's set in a grove, all right? And it, this painting is also famous for the hundreds of flowers that are depicted. So though you cannot smell any of them, it indicates that it's extremely perfumed, which is very charming. There's orange blossom and there's roses and there's jasmine and there's narcissi and there's pimpernel and grape hyacinth and daisies and cornflowers and carnations. And very importantly, myrtle. Myrtle, if you see the central figure who is Venus, all around her, those little leaves, those are myrtle leaves. And she was um, the, Myrtle leaves were also always associated with uh, weddings. All brides would have had uh, wedding bouquets with myrtle leaves in them. And um, 
then to, to refer also, I'd like to make a comment about the clothes, which are sort of contemporary dress, but also th sort of theatrical costumes as they would have been designed for masquerades at that period. So as you see, every single detail of this painting would have been um, required of Botticelli to reproduce it in, and paint it in this way. And now all the, all the women look pregnant to me. They, they do, they do. But there was actually, interestingly, that was kind of fashionable to re reproduce women with a kind of slightly rounded belly. Though, so some of them look very much more pregnant than the other. For example, Venus at the center looks more pregnant than the others. And maybe indeed Flora looks quite round bellied uh, because, well, Flora, fecundity, the flowers, etc. Maybe the, the nymphs aren't so, they're just kind of flexing their bodies, but not necessarily more pregnant. So A, it's fashion, and B, maybe the whole idea of fertility in, in, in the women in this painting. So we, you're gonna take us inside now? Yes, can, can we do the first painting? Now, as we've, we've been looking at that painting, and, and it, it, you absolutely have to read this painting from left to right. Now, this is um, Mercury, and he is the great traveler and messenger and herald. And he herald, in this painting, he's heralding spring. And he's, in his right hand, he's had his caduceus. And he, if you look up to the top left, he's pushing away the clouds. He's pushing away the dark clouds of winter. So he's clearing this grove of the winter clouds and winter. This is really the beginning of spring. And he's, he's, he is also, uh, Mercury is the god of, of May, so that is also end of spring. And he's, he, he's wearing the sword, so he's the guardian of the garden. And, um, and the other reference of Mercury is that he was the god of medicine and of doctors, i.e. Medici, and therefore the Medici family. So that, that one character is playing all these roles within the painting. And he, he's looking out of the painting to the left because he's keeping the clouds out and he's keeping anybody who might have invaded this sacred grove away. He's a, he's a very talented man, isn't it? Isn't oh. he? <laughs> he's a young, so, handsome um, god. Okay. And all, all the women have to do is stand around being pregnant. Shall I go yes, to the next one? Yes, please. Now, many people identify these as the three graces, but my great friend and uh, mentor, uh, Professor Pauline Voot, said that no, these are the Hesperides, and who were originally uh, were the daughters of Hesperus, and they had to guard the golden apple tree. So as, you, as we saw, there's not just one golden apple, there are many in this grove, but they are the Hesperides. And they, uh, they were called um, the nymphs of evening and golden light and sunset, clear voiced daughters of night. And, and also importantly, as we were referring to, this is the, the great period of the Renaissance. And it was during the Renaissance time that there were quite a few poems were written about the Hesperides, about these three nymphs. And so that is probably why they were included in this painting. But they're also included simply because if you see them, they're, they're dancing around in this rather beautiful circle with their hands all linked and, and their gowns kind of floating around them with their movement. I mean, they are utterly exquisite and delicate with these beautiful transparent voile around their bodies. And they and they you see they're looking at each other and they're very sort of concentrated in this rather sacred dance. I think they are really beautiful. And I think so. Now, all, they, all they have to do is stand around being pregnant and dancing. I love the fact that their hair looks almost golden in colour. It is, and it's I, it's very, if you look at other paintings by Botticelli, that he loves to paint hair in these great, beautiful knots kind of falling down and these beautiful hairstyles. I think you'd have to have heaps and heaps of hair to have your hair done in such a magnificent way, but it is beautiful. And so we can go to Venus. So here we have Venus, who is the central character. 
and it plays a very important, important role. Um, the wind of early spring blows on the land and brings forth growth and flowers presided over by Venus, the goddess of April. So we've had, we're kind of going backwards. We had, first of all, we had May, now we're going to April, but she's the goddess of April. And as I said earlier on, she's surrounded by Myrtle, Nitus conjugalis, so which is the, the name given to Myrtle. And, um, and it's associated with Venus and Cupid and represents honest and legitimate love. So there. She appears as the goddess of marriage and clothed with her hair modestly covered as a married woman would be expected to appear in public. And she also looks pregnant. Now, what is interesting about Venus is that she's ruling over both earthly and divine love. And it was argued that she was the classical equivalent of the Virgin Mary. And this is alluded to by the way she is framed in an altar-like setting in this painting um, to contemporary images of the Virgin Mary. So that is this kind of double role in this. To, and it brings us back to the kind of Neoplatonism and the beauty being close to God. And I'm, I'm now going to digress because as some of you already know, I'm always fascinated by fabrics. And if you look at the cloak she's wearing, which would probably have been produced in Florence, which produced the most magnificent materials at that time, the cloak is red on one side and blue on the other, and is embroidered all the way through with this diaper pattern in gold. And all the way along the hem, there is more embroidery and these little pearls hanging from those that, from the hem. So, I mean, she, no, everything that could indicate that this painting is of, of richness and beauty and whatever is alluded to in this painting. It is lovely. Can I ask you what a Neoplatonist is, please? Uh, it, <laughs> I know I've referred to this several times and also to Ficino, who was a, a scholar at the court of Lorenzo. And it was a returning, uh, because for many years it, within Christianity, the, the, the writings of the, um, the Greek and the Roman uh, philosophers had been slightly put, in, put to aside, but not forgotten. And at this time, they were being studied more and more. And so therefore, th those people returning and studying the, the, the writings of Plato and how, it, and how Plato's thought on God corresponded with many people of, of other people's, the Christian thoughts on God. And they were given this title of the Neoplatonism and was extremely important in, in the choice of subject matter of many paintings and in poetry and in writings of that time. Does that answer Thank your you. question? It's quite complicated. <laughs> it does. I'm just absorbing. Thank you. Nice. Next picture, next portion. Are you happy to go to the next portion? Yes, please. Beautiful. Wow. I can't believe this painting is 600 years old, Suzanne. It is. And she's extraordinary. Well, I, I'm glad you like it and maybe you understand my passionate desire to, to look yes. at it and to look at it really closely. And this is Primavera, this is, or otherwise Flora. And we'll, I didn't have a complete picture of her, so, but I wanted us to look at her face because it's so pretty and it's surrounded with flowers. And you can recognize that one of the flowers, the, the black flower is in fact carnations, Dianthus. Now Dianthus is the flower of Zeus and Zeus was her father, or Zeus. How do you- Zeus. 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 All right, Zeus. I say Zeus, you say Zeus. Yes, let's not go down to the tomatoes of which there are absolutely none in this painting. However, around her neck, you can see uh, cornflowers and daisies and other such flowers and more myrtle. Now, uh, looking at her face, if when you look at other paintings by Botticelli, he was passionately in love and was utterly inspired by a woman of the time called Simonetta Vespucci. And when you look at his paintings, nearly all his women look a little bit similar. And they, I think they all look a little bit like Simonetta. <laughs> she is very beautiful. She's beautiful across 600 years, isn't she? She is beautiful Next. forever. She will always yes. be beautiful. You can never, ever not say that this face is not 
completely entrancing and, and seductive and inspiring. She looks up to me, she almost looks like Kate Blanchett, maybe even more beautiful. I think now. Now, um, I brought this painting in and according This to isn't part of the Primavera, is it? This is another painting. No, this is part of the Primavera. This is the detail. This wow. is the detail from this painting. And I absolutely wanted a detail because I've spoken at length about all the flowers that are in this painting, which we can't see very well. And my friend, who's an absolute genius on flowers, uh, 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 Celia uh, Jones, helped me find this one. And it is a, um, it is a Iris Germanica, I'm told, uh, an almost black Iris. And another reference to Florence it is the symbolic flower of Florence. If you look at it also, there's, you can see little blue cornflowers, you can see daisies, and up, the, up at the top right, you can see little pimpernel. And is that when, the pimpernel? That's the pimpernel. And also, if you look at the iris, you see the fluffy bits on the top part of the petal. If you come back to the iris, you see the little fluffy yellow bits on the top part of the petal, and the, the fact that the petals are almost transparent. This is just, and, and if when you consider that in that painting, all the flowers will have been painted with, with that same level of care and attention to detail. I wonder how long it took him to paint this. <laughs> um, I don't know, because it say, they say it's painted between 1470 and the early 1480s, probably off and on for many months. So okay. we can have the next painting, the next detail. Now that flower is at the bottom right. That iris we were looking at is at the bottom. Ah, right. Just here. That? Just there. Because yes. above it, you can see that little golden uh, border uh, of the, the, uh, the, the goddess that's just above that. Yes. So we have here Boreas. Now Boreas, it was the purple winged god of the north wind. There's that rather very cold looking fellow coming in from the right hand side. He was, he was the god of winter and he swept down from the cold mountains chilling the air with his icy breath. However, he's on his way out because when he sought a wife, this is unfortunate for her, he carried off Aurethea. And this is Aurethea being being carried off. And as she turns her head, you can see she's probably screaming in terror. And out of her mouth comes ivy and other little flowers kind of floating down. And, um, and he whisked her off. Uh, they got married and they had many children. But importantly, what this symbolizes is the relationship between the air and the earth. He's taking it's, it's just the sky and the earth and, 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 of course, how they are related. And he also is, because he's coming in from the right and he's going again away of his motion is to go off to the right, he's, he's going off, winter is leaving. And also, while we've got this, we can look at the rest of Primavera's dress. If you look at her dress, which has all these little flowers painted all over them, and her right hand is stretching into her held up dress and it's full of flowers and she's taking her right hand is going to place more throw more flowers out at everybody's feet um and she's just so graceful and beautiful in that painting you could just look at her for hours so with that where, did you tell us did you tell us where the painting is um, would we be able to see it is it well, in Florence? it's in the Uffizi in Florence. Suzanne, I was just going to pick up, uh, hi, it's Julian here. I was just going to pick up on a question earlier, which was someone asked, how long did it take him to paint this? And having had the benefit of a chat with Amy, our painter daughter who lives in Florence, she said that basically the Florentine school would have drawn it first. So this would have been something that um, Botticelli would have constructed out of drawings and then elaborated upon and, and improved and because for a moment I mean the composition is so gorgeous I had imagined my naivety that it had been a sort of setup of various models but it wasn't it was all constructed from um, drawings that he'd done. Yes I would have 
thought so. I mean, when I when I was going on about ha, ha, why it looked the way it does, and, and and he would have been told what had to be on this painting. He would have spent months doing the drawings and the, the preparation for it. it yeah. He wouldn't have just put up the boards and put the base on the board and start painting. It would have been built up over weeks of work and study. Is that unlike uh, the Venetian school of, of Tintoretto of, of Tintoretto and Titian, who painted from life? The Florentine school was was painting from drawing or or using drawings as the basis. Yes, but Titian would have been drawing all day and every day so that when his brush hit the canvas, he knew exactly what he was going to do. And if you know your Rubens and your Titian and other artists, nearly always before they did a, a, a large work, they would have done cartoons for them and yeah. drawings and paintings. So. And actually, it, the National Gallery has some fabulous Rubens cartoons, and I prefer, in some ways, his cartoons to the his prep sketches to some of the finished paintings because they're just stunning. But of course, it, there would have been weeks of prep before he did this painting. So we... our last character, another chap, another busy chap. In another the busy chap. The chaps are also busy, aren't they? Oh, all the chaps are busy. This is Cupid, who's above uh, Venus, and we'll, we'll return to the painting again, so you can have one last look at it. And you can see that these are oranges. I don't know, did I say that oranges had, uh, had only just arrived in Europe at that time? And that also to have this orange grove is another uh, indication of the wealth of the Medici, because oranges were a very prized fruit. So you can see these oranges, and you can see all the orange blossom. And you can see that Cupid is blindfolded. And that's very important because he's not aiming at anybody in particular, but his arrow is tipped with flames, the heat of spring, light and flames equaling love. So that has very important work to do there. And now if we can look at the whole painting again, please. So there we are, um, Primavera by Botticelli. And we've gone through it in, in great detail. As you can see, the Venus in the middle, she seems to have these, she is framed in an archway similar to painting <clears throat> of the Virgin, uh, Virgin Mary in lots of paintings at the time. And you can see the whole of the painting. Are there any questions on this painting before we go off to the next one? No? Okay. Um, now we can go off to the our last painting. Our last painting. And because I love to end with uh, and possibly give you a smile, this one is also called Primavera. And you can see how it has been inspired. And it was painted, it's a contemporary painting, painted by Cécile Marchand. Uh, it's in a private collection. And it was brought to my attention by the art connoisseur and critic, um, uh, Julian Mosley who suggested we could finish with this. And also, actually, uh, the, hippopo hip the Egyptians re re regarded hippopotami as symbols of fertility. So again, we are not leaving this whole idea of a spring and fertility and fecundity because we see a load of ferrumping hippopotami in the primavera type positions in this painting. And with that, I hope it will make you smile. And with that, I say thank you. That's today's talk finished. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. We're all applauding you. We can't hear anyone because <laughs> they're on mute. That was fantastic. Thank and you. this, did you say this picture is in a private collection? Yes. But where? In Paris. Where? In Paris. In Paris. Some fecund hippos. They all look very fecund. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Which is your um, favourite painting? I presume it's the Botticelli. It is the Botticelli, yes. Um, having, and, and I really wanted for once in one of my talks with all you people, lovely people to do a painting um, from almost from start to finish, as it were, and to really point out how much there is to see in a painting. 
and maybe next time you you go to a gallery instead of walking quickly past you will spend quite a lot of time looking at the details and pondering about the details as to why an artist has done it this way and what does he want to express well Suzanne you've changed my approach to looking at paintings in the last year since you've been doing these talks you have taught me so much thank you um, I probably can't remember all the detail but you've given me a new way of looking at paintings that I never had before and I say that genuinely and I'm sure I'm not the only person who's taken that away from these wonderful talks. Thank you for all the work you've put into them and for teaching us that. And I hope your offer still is there for a post lockdown visit to some of the art galleries in London, maybe even in Florence, where you're going to take us and show us some more paintings in detail. But really you have been inspiring. Well, um, you've, I, I, you've, uh, you've, you've given me confidence to look at a painting. Um, this is coming from Barbara Want, who has the most wonderful collection of paintings in her house. So she, you know, she <laughs> knows an awful lot about paintings and has an absolutely perfect eye. But I have to also... I don't... Do you know, Suzanne, I haven't got any Botticellis. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> who would like to ask Suzanne a question? I'm far away. I'll never be able to see if you put your hands up. So unmute yourself. And Oh, Richard! Might you have a question? Richard in Spain. I'm getting used to being put on the spot by Barbara as soon as the talk finishes. <laughs> I did have a question prepared, actually. I was going to ask Barbara if she could summarise what the new Platonists are. Um, <laughs> that's a little unfair without any prior. That, 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 that's more than unfair. That's something that we need to discuss <laughs> later. Unfortunately for me, that's all my mean. questions... I know, I know, but revenge is sweet. Um, my, unfortunately for me and my the questions I'm supposed to ask most of my I think all my questions were answered as, as you went through Suzanne I I was going to ask if the ladies in tissue paper were the three graces and apparently they're not and I guess that the dark figure was a sort of a symbol of winter which in a way he is isn't he because he's the north yes. wind and, and I thought it was spring escaping from winter but you explained the the legend behind the myth behind it Boreas and, I love the term Boreas Yes, well, it's where the Aurora Borealis comes from, isn't it? The North Northern Lights. Very probably, so. yes, exactly. Origin, the North Wind, yeah. Yeah, so re really lovely. And, and as um, Barbara said, it's so nice to... I, I would have looked at that picture and seen a disparate group of people standing around amongst trees, uh, <laughs> probably, as um, Barbara said, looking as pregnant as hippopotami. Um, and to, to know all the symbolism, or at least be aware of all the symbolism is really quite quite fantastic and and to look at the detail again I, I mean this is my ignorance but I would have just thought well there's sort of flowery colors in there but to know that they're representations of you know botanically accurate flowers is is really lovely um and I also agree with what Barbara said the face of Simonetta Vespucci looks could be out of a fashion magazine today really very very modern looking face Having said that, I've decided that Uffizi can keep the painting because I, for a feeling of spring, I really loved the first three. Uh, ah, the good. Sisley, the, yeah, the, uh, just for the feeling of spring, not, not for the interpretation of the paintings. But the, the Spencer, the Sisley and the uh, Inchbold, I thought were just absolutely lovely. And that laburnum is fabulous. The laburnum is amazing, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if they have laburnum in other countries, but that somehow says to me an Eng English country garden, yeah, some yeah, rather they're... delicate English country home. They have it in Italy. They have it in Italy. I'm sure. I'm sure they do. And 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 again, and you know, I have to. I have to thank you, Barbara, and I have to thank Fiona, and I have to thank my friend Pauline Vrout, Professor Pauline Vrout, and uh, uh, and Celia Jones, and also. Uh, Julian Mosley, because all of you guys have helped to contribute to the choice of paintings uh, and the interpretation of the paintings today. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, does anybody else agree with me that, uh, you know, when I started looking at the looking for a painting of spring, I realized that spring is not only what you see, but what you feel, or what you desire. It is a, a physical desire for spring. And, and when I was looking for paintings, they didn't, to begin with, that didn't sort of come to mind. It was, but only afterwards, kind of having thought about it, did I understand what it was that I thought expressed spring for me. 
I like the better idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there's something, it's about, yeah, it's the only season we yearn for, isn't it? It's exactly. the one we really yearn for. And then when you wake up and it's actually grey, cloudy and cold and the central heating is still on, you do feel slightly let down <laughs> because it should be sunny and yellow, yellow flowers and blue skies. But that will come. That will Does anyone come. else have any questions for Suzanne? No. Just to know, well, you mentioned the light, um, Suzanne, right at the beginning. That really struck a chord with me because there's always a day in the year when, when I'm suddenly aware of the light before the flowers. And it reminds me, I used to, I, years and years ago, I worked in the French Alps in the winter. And even with the snow still on the ground, there's something about the light in the sky. And perhaps you can leave your window open because it's not quite so cold outside that, that tells you spring is on its way. And for me, it's almost more of a, well, it almost comes before the daffodils and the forsythia. I, I agree with you. I think that's why this one works for me so yes. well. The light in this and the air just feels... Sorry, I interrupted. Somebody's got a question. Hello. It's Jerome. Uh, the the, the uh, Botticelli, is that life-size or larger than life? You mean the figures in the Botticelli? Yes. Jerome, I really cannot tell you. I, I actually gave the size of the painting to begin with. It's... Um, Six foot by ten feet. Yeah. Six foot high by ten feet. So they would be. So you, if that's ten feet, six foot high, um, ha, and they are they are about two thirds of that size. So no, they're not life size. It's not far off actually. When you see it in the room in the Uffizi, it does strike you very powerfully. It, it does feel almost life size. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us over the last months. I, I don't know if this is the last one. Maybe it is. Maybe life is about to change again or revert or whatever. But we couldn't have done this without all of you joining and all your lovely comments. And um, and of course, we couldn't have done it without Fiona, who always claims she's just a small cog in the wheel, whereas actually she is the wheel. She is the cart. She does the lot. She bosses us around and she makes things happen and she's amazing. So thank you to Fiona. But thank you also for joining us and thank you for Suzanne. And I hope soon that we will be embarking on, oh, on, on a real life tour of London's art galleries. So stay tuned. Thank you very much thank and you. good evening. Okay. Bye-bye. Cool. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you so thank much, you. Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Bye-bye. Thanks.